Warning, the Stone Age Gamer includes a lot of bad language. Cover your mother ears. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to episode 199 of the Stone Age Gamer Podcast for the week of April 27th, 2018. I am Chris Randazzo and joining me tonight is unintentional IGN logo, Dan Ryan. Hi, here I am, copy and pasted right down here in the bottom <laughs> left-hand corner. You thought we weren't paying attention, but we were. <laughs> no, I thought I, was, I thought I was cleverly disguised as that leaf. We're one week away from our 200th episode, which is giving me the chuckles tonight for some reason. Because it's dumb, Chris. It's kind of absurd that we've been doing this this long. It really is. But anyway, you know, whatever. You know, well, we're, we're going to do what we do best, which is looking back at games that came out 10, 20, and 30 years ago, because coming up with original ideas is hard. But before we go any further, here's your weekly reminder that you can email us at mail at Just include the words Stone Age Gamer in the subject line, and you can let us know what you think of our show, what topics you would like us to discuss in the future, or just say hello, because we always want to hear from you, the listeners. Dan, I had a really fun experience this weekend. What's that? I, uh, my friend Rich was in town. Uh, good, good buddy Rich, he, uh, he moved out to um, Chicago. And he's been dealing with, like, weird pizza and stuff for a while now. Oh, Chicago's uh, so fun, though. Yeah, he seems to be having a good time. Uh, he works for Google, um, but, oh. like, in the the food service department. <laughs> like, he's, oh. like, a, in charge of, the <laughs> like, the cafes and shit. It's it's a strange job, but apparently he's very good at it. So he's back in, he was back in town to, the, to visit for, uh, for a weekend or whatever. And uh, I went to hang out with him and my other buddy, Mauricio, who... Um, I love Mauricio to death, and like he has this great story about how he got fired for stealing Hollywood video coupons and selling them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> fun, fun tale. Uh, the, the short version is uh, so when we worked at Game Crazy, Mauricio was one of my employees, and um, he uh, we used to give out these. If you bought a game system, you'd get twelve free rentals from Hollywood Video, right? And like they would just give us mountains of these coupons they weren't inventoried or anything yeah no they didn't count for anything they didn't although remember when they did that was because of mauricio <laughs> <laughs> nice somebody online caught caught wind that mauricio had been selling these hollywood video coupons on ebay for th like he made thousands of dollars doing this. how it was just selling them by the stack for like ten, twenty dollars a piece or something. Like he made a lot of money doing it. Wow. He'd been doing it for a while. I had no idea. Nobody had any idea. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like I'm at work one day and uh, they, they they called ahead to see if Mauricio was in. I was like, yeah, he's in. He's 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 here. What's up? He's like, yeah, we're, we're just coming by. <laughs> okay, we're just uh, we're just gonna come uh, talk to him. They took him into the back for like a long time, and we were just out there like, "What the hell's going on?" And then he came out, and they're like, "Yeah, I don't work here anymore. See you later." <laughs> and they told me the story, and like basically, there's like they all said, "All right, either we're gonna take you out in handcuffs, or you're gonna pay us back this money." <laughs> wow! And so he he got on a payment plan and paid him back all the money. So wow, thousands of dollars to Hollywood Video. Yeah, it was like you know three grand or something like that i don't remember it was man if you just would have waited like a month or two they would have gone out of business you wouldn't have had to pay back yeah no, this was a couple this was like two years before they were gone but yeah no. imagine well. how much more he would have made anyway um anyway. so i was hanging out with rich and mauricio and uh um we were just kind of hanging out in mauricio's apartment looking for you know what to do and we played with the super nintendo classic edition for a while mm -hmm. and uh, we played some street fighter and that was a lot of fun and then we eventually got around to like, all right, well, what other multiplayer games on here? And I said, well, who wants to play me in Kirby's Dream Course? And neither Rich nor Mauricio had ever played Kirby's Dream Course before. Because it's terrible. No, it's oh. not terrible. Oh. <laughs> Kirby's Dream Course is freaking amazing. And I feel like it's a criminally underplayed game. And so Rich had, you know, he was the one who played against me. And when it was over, he was like, why are, hasn't there been like 300 sequels to this game? And I'm like, well, because it's called Kirby's Dream Course and nobody bought it. Because why <laughs> would you buy a game called Kirby's Dream Course unless you're me? Yeah. And uh, Kirby's Dream Course is absolutely amazing. It's um, it's like a mini golf sort of game. Like it, okay. It, it plays with the rules of golf, 
where like so you're you're Kirby and you do the whole like absorbing powers thing, but like just by running into the the bad guys. So there's like a bunch of monsters on the on the screen in the course, and you like do a shot as Kirby as the ball, like you shoot him as the ball, and you run into the enemies. And if they're enemies that have powers, you get that power, and then you can use it like once per turn. And then sure. the last enemy that's left on the screen becomes the hole, and then you have to make it in there. And gross. <laughs> there's a competitive <laughs> mode that is. Absolutely awesome, and uh, I felt wonderful having introduced somebody to Kirby's Dream Course this weekend because uh, it's a great game, and more people should play it. All right, then. What did you do? <laughs> uh, I mean, I got God of War. Yeah? It's all right. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like... You know, <laughs> fine. It's just perfectly adequate. It's, it it is it is indeed a video game. <laughs> Steve of War. It, it might, dude. This game is at the same time not at all a God of War game. Mm-hmm. Yet the exact sequel it should have been. Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the things that interests me so much about it is that it really seems to be a uh, complete reinvention of what it is. You know, like it's 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 clearly got the same DNA, but it's just a complete reinvention, and that's that's awesome to me. It is it is so wildly different that I I'm I don't know five six hours into the game at this point, and um, at just now at this point. I feel like I am starting to play this God of War the way that it is meant to be played and not trying to do like God of War style combos that you would do with the Blades of Chaos with the Leviathan axe because you know it's not attached to you with a fucking chain it's not possible to do to play it that way so, but you can summon it like Thor's hammer, right? Like you can, like you can. So, the com- the the control scheme is very similar um, to like a good version of Resident Evil Four. Um, okay, get bent. <laughs> Go no, on. it is it is very similar to Resident Evil Four um, in the way that that Kratos moves. He is uh, he's quicker than Leon was in that game, and there's a lot more um, evasive maneuvering that you can do um but a a similar kind of camera focus and and the combat plays out somewhat similarly as well uh so you have the leviathan axe and you can um you know you can put it away whenever you want like you can just kind of sheath it on on your back and you can fight with your fists if you want and you have a shield that you can block with this like he kratos just like puts his arm up in front of him in this shield come like just kind of appears it's uh it's pretty sweet but as you're playing with uh if you're fighting with the axe you can like start a combo and in the middle of the combo you can throw the axe at an enemy that's further away and then start beating the shit out of another couple of guys and as somebody is charging at you you call the axe back to you and it will hit the guy that's coming at you like on the return all the while you have atreus off to the side shooting arrows at people um and he has different combat things that you can upgrade because you can upgrade everything you can upgrade all of these different moves and, and get different stuff and you have different runes that you can attach to the axe so that you can do different special moves um it's a very very deep combat system and like i said i feel like i'm just now starting to get the hang of it um What's really interesting to me is, uh, because I've been watching a lot of reviews and stuff, is uh, I didn't realize that, uh, until reading the reviews, that the game features no camera cuts. Absolutely none. From the second you start the game, you start chopping down a tree, there is not a cut after that. (laughs) Cut. Tree. It is... You see what I did there? (laughs) It is stunning. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, I wonder if it wasn't pointed out how many people would actually really get that. Well, like, what, what's crazy about it is that 
you know, a lot of games are really good about doing it now, where if your character has custom armor on, um, that armor will appear in the cutscene. Mm -hmm. um, but since this is all done in-game, whatever Kratos is wearing is what is what is happening on the screen at, at different pivotal, you know, like, story moments. And it can be wildly different for people who are playing because you have, like I said, a ton of customization in this game. Like, you get different armor sets, and you can get a different chest piece, a different waist piece, and different uh, gauntlets for your arms. And... Like, all of those can be upgraded, and you can add different stuff to it. Like, it's it's a very deep, deep game. It's... it Visually, it is the best-looking game I've ever played. Yeah, it's pretty astonishing-looking. The, there are moments in this game where, like, I, I will record a video so that I can go back and watch the video because I want to look at all the stuff that is happening. You know, the, the scene where Jormungandr, the world serpent, pops up for the first time. I don't know if he pops up again. I say first time. That's not a spoiler. I, he might not be in it again. I haven't seen him certainly a second time. But you're you're paddling your boat across this lake. And, the, like, the controller starts to rumble and all of this stuff happens. And the camera pans way, way out into the distance. And, like, over top of the mountain, as the as the water is shaking and your controller is vibrating and these waves are starting to pop up, you see a snake body and these gigantic scales just start moving in between the peaks of the mountain. It's like, what the fuck is that? And then Jormungandr pops up and he starts talking and every time his his voice is so deep, the controller is freaking out in your hand. <laughs> like, the vibration is so, so strong. It's It's nuts, dude. Absolutely not. I have never quite played anything like this. And it is not God of War. Like, if you are expecting any of the previous six God of War games, like I think most of us were, um, you know, Tiff said it when we were talking about it. She said, I have never been more excited to play a game, yet also more disappointed at the same time. Hmm. Because it does not play. You can't... There is no jump button. Really? Like, you don't jump. You don't have a double jump. The wings don't pop up like all the upgrades that you would get in the previous God of War games. There are points where you have to jump across ledges and shit, and you hit the circle button, and he jumps, but there's That's no more jump. Like pseudo QTE almost, more than, almost. Just an than an, a literal jump button. Right. Wow, that's wild. It's, it's like I said, I <laughs> it am still just has the dodge now, roll, though. Yes. Like, I've seen that. But it's not mapped to the right analog stick oh it is it's the x button so if you hit x once you'll dodge in the direction that you're pressing if you hit it twice like a, a double tap then you'll roll out of the way so starting to incorporate that into the combat because i mean that was one of the things about the original god of war game is that it, it was i mean or that original series was was basically gore porn to a point, you know, like it was just crazy violent and insane combos and you're rolling around and the combat felt so smooth because you just had to tap a couple of buttons and then flick that analog stick and you're halfway across the screen into another mm -hmm. combo and you're jumping and spinning the blades and grabbing shit out of the air and using spells and all that stuff. And the combat is so, so different in this. Like that mm -hmm. is just not shit you do. Now you can you know, combo into one thing and roll and throw the axe at something that's in the air and start beating something up with your, your fists and then, like, grab that thing, rip it apart, something else comes flying in and you, you call the axe back and then you have Atreus do a spell with the arrows and, like, you know, I just got this phoenix rune where, like, all these, like, birds come out and attack and shit. And, like, there's there's a lot of really cool stuff like that, but it it just, it is a vastly different game. It hmm. makes sense why it's called God of War and not God of War 4. Because yeah. it is it is not that series. It's just kind of a hard reboot a reboot not gameplay wise reboot, not a uh, not a storyline reboot. Yeah, like I mean this is this is much more of an adventure action game whereas mm -hmm. the other ones were action adventure games. 
if that makes sense. It does, um, yeah. The 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 storytelling is also really fascinating because, like I said, I'm like five hours into the game. I don't know why Kratos is here. I don't <laughs> know why his new wife is dead. I don't know who she was. I don't know, you know. I don't know if Atreus is his kid. Was it her kid? Like I I don't know any of this stuff. There's this character that pops up, the Witch of the Woods. She knows who Kratos is. Um, she's the second character that you that you meet throughout the game who knows who Kratos is. And I'm not like spoiling anything here, um, you know. But she basically says, "I know who you are. The gods of this realm are not going to be happy, you know, that you're here. They don't they don't take kindly to outsiders. So does that mean she is not a Norse god? Like who the fuck is she? <laughs> it. The other thing that really threw me about this game is that the previous God of War games, right, are known for their uh, their opening epic battle, right? You have the Leviathan or the Hydra in the first one. You have the Stone mm -hmm. Colossus in the thir in the second one, and then you have um, Poseidon in God of War three. So these these crazy epic opening battles that happen within the first five minutes of the game, and the first half hour of this game is you chopping down a tree, paddling a canoe, and getting some background story with Atreus. Hmm. Just starts off so much slower. There is a really crazy battle that happens in the beginning. But it takes some time to get there. But it's awesome. It was so good. It was so fun. Fucking love this game. I, it it is the best game that will come out this year. Fair enough. I I mean I can't I can't disagree with you. I have no way of playing it. <laughs> it's not not going to happen anytime soon. But uh, it does it does sound very cool, and I'm glad everyone's enjoying it. I'm glad it's going well. It it really uh, is. It it is. It, it's a stunning achievement to I'm to do something. That they, so yeah, that they went something so that they went yeah. with something so different, and um, you know, this is like you know, this is this year's Horizon, um, mm -hmm. which is super cool, and it, it's 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 interesting to think about. Like uh, this came out on the same day, right? It came out on the twentieth, right? Yeah, it's, same it's, day as Super it, Troopers too, and Labo, and Labo. <laughs> it's so crazy thinking about like where we are with the uh, the video games right now. We're like, all right, well, Nintendo's doing this bizarre thing and uh then sony's dropping god of war and i'm sure xbox players are doing something what what's the feedback been on labo i have not seen <laughs> jack shit about it i haven't seen any reviews but it does seem to be um i've been listening to a lot of people on podcasts who have messed around with it and it does seem to be like exactly what we think it is like mm. this is a really cool thing to engage kids in um and you get it like teaches you all kinds of stuff and kind of gets your brain, your gears turning for like engineering and whatnot. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's the games are, they don't seem to be extraordinarily, uh, you know, in depth or anything. Like Dean built mm -hmm. it, he, he, yeah. he bought the robot kit. Well, and, and he's um, not that smart. So, no, he's not. <laughs> I mean, if Dean built it, <laughs> Dean built it, took him a good long while because the robot kit's like uber, uh, you know, it's that that's the super complicated one. But he said that the actual robot itself works unbelievably well. Like it's just ridiculously responsive how well it works with your movements, uh, which is crazy to me. That how it's all just based on like you know white dots and the IR sensors right. and stuff. It's such a weird, weird piece of tech. And like I really would like to get it, but I just don't think my I don't think my kids are old enough for it yet. I, I it is a thing where. You know, because the girl's birthday is coming up. Um, that might be a very cool birthday present. But I am not confident that it is going to be around long enough to pay full price for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It um, is, I mean, like, yeah, the robot kit in particular. The other one, yeah. I feel like, is worth the money because it comes with, like, so many different kits. And, like, just the number of hours that it seems to like just lining up like this takes this long to build. Right. It seems to line up to like, okay, that is mathematically this many dollars worth of entertainment or, or use. Yeah. The robot one, it just doesn't, I get why it costs what it costs because it's freaking complicated, but 
I just don't feel like that one's a very good value. You know what I mean? Yeah, it ju- it just doesn't seem to be. Yeah, and like if there's not going to be future neat. stuff, yeah, like it's a neat party trick. Yeah, and like I'm sure the game is is cute and fun for a little bit, but like I'm not you know messing with that for a long time, and who knows what else they're going to do with it. But like the stuff that's interesting me is like all the like the Labo Garage and. I'm already starting to see things pop up, up up on Twitter of like things that people are inventing with this already. Yeah, because they they all come. The thing about the uh, the the multi kit thing is that it, it all comes with like extra pieces and stuff. And they're like, all right, go nuts, fig, fig, figure shit out. <laughs> right, know? make something this cool. Is, this is what we got. Now you make something cool. And like people are already coming up with some some interesting stuff. So I'm I'm curious to see where this goes. Um, and what's cool about it is it, it teaches you with all of those little, uh, the little different things, all the different things you can do with the uh, the IR sensor. So it's like, all right, so you build the piano, so now you know how the piano works. So now, what else can you do? What else can you make the the Switch Joy-Con pick up on to like make a little game out of? Like you can do that kind of stuff. I, I believe there's like actually like rudimentary game programming stuff in there too, almost like like make your own WarioWare style games. And that's yeah. that's what's interesting to me. And that yeah, seems like, like there, a, there's cool potential there. Yeah, for for the right minds, that seems like a really cool thing to have. And I think in like a year or two, my kids will be or at least John will be there, and he'll get a real kick out of the building. And like you know, everything's done together in 3D, and you can rotate it in the uh, in the instructions to see each each piece and where it goes and why, and and that's really great. Um, I just I wish I wish I had a better excuse to buy it, but I I don't, so I'm I'm not going to. But who knows how long this is going to stick around? I mean, there's there's a bunch of sh- stuff in that original trailer that isn't part of either of these packs, so you know they've got more stuff planned. So yeah, they'll I, probably do like a refresh, uh, like a second volume of stuff, you know, September October to make this more of a Christmas push. Yeah. I don't... Man, you know, like I said, I I really, I really want this to do well, because I I really want this to be a cool thing that, um, like that that people can make cool stuff with, and but they have to like I feel like they have to actually release games for it. Yeah, you know, otherwise it just becomes a really expensive version of that multi-pack adapter for the Wiimote. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And that's not fun. You know what I mean? Like, that's that novelty wears away really quickly. Well, that's what I think. The 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 thing that I've heard the most about it is that, like, the I know it may sound cliche, but really the f- the fun of this and the most fun that you'll get out of this is the actual building of the things. And that's that's, like, kind of... That's really what they're selling you on is the process of actually building these things. Like, yeah. and some of them take five minutes. Some of them take a couple of hours and that's the, the, I guess that's what they're really trying to sell you on. And I don't know. I wish I had, like I said, I wish I had an excuse to buy it so that I could mess around with it myself, but it just doesn't, doesn't work with my, my current existence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah, so. it's like, so We've got God of War, and it, this is what I was just thinking about before. Is like so, God of War is like that's that's the P- big PS4 game this year, right? Just like like a Horizon was the big PS4 game last year, yeah. And it's like looking at the uh, the the Switch lineup, they've got they don't have like you know they had Mario and Zelda last year, and this year uh, I, it seems like their big thing is Smash and possibly Fire Emblem, which we haven't heard thing one about since they said that it was coming out this year last year but um uh, but then they've also got like smash is huge don't get me wrong but it's not that kind of thing you know what i mean there doesn't seem to be any one big single player epic uh on the switch which i guess i'm more or less okay with because i'm not i'm not finding myself wanting for things but at the same time i kind of wish there was something because that was so cool last year to have playstation have horizon and nintendo have uh zelda and like them be these both masterpieces of games and similar but different directions. Mm-hmm. And that was really cool. And I'd love to see something akin to God of War on Switch. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, as, as cool as Bayonetta is, it's one, it's a re-release. And two, it's not that, at least to my knowledge, it's not that freaking caliber. But 
Right. Um, I don't know. We'll see where the rest of the year goes, because really, we, we don't know what's coming out in the back half of this year. And the front half is so freaking loaded. It's. I just went down the list of all the crap that's coming out. So I, I was thinking to myself, like, all right, I'm making some progress. I'm I'm coming up to the end of Bayonetta, and I know this because uh, I'm in a giant tower and I'm fighting all the bosses. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, clearly I'm at the end of this game, which is good because I really want to move on to Bayonetta too. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, what am I doing next? Like Kirby's kind of a a long term thing. I don't know how long that game is, and I'm just playing like a, you know a level every couple of days or so, and it's it's a blast. But um. Now I'm kind of wondering what is going to fill up my time. And then I was like, oh, South Park came out. And then I looked at the other stuff that is like on the horizon uh, over the next like couple of uh, months, just just, you know, May, June and a little bit of July. And I was like, oh, crap, I I don't even know if I can actually afford to buy all this stuff. Yeah, because I mean, you've got uh, uh, where is I, I wrote this down earlier. I'm looking at a. Uh, um just uh where the heck is it oh there it is all right so i've got on may 4th donkey kong which now i'm thinking of skipping because of all the rest of this stuff because may 22nd is both Mega Man legacy collections okay and runner three then on may 29th like a week later the street fighter collection comes out then on my birthday june 22nd is mario tennis june 29th they announced today is wolfenstein and then on mm-hmm. July 24th is the X collection. And somewhere in there is a uh, bomb chicken, which they haven't have done. It's coming out in June. They don't have a specific date on and Lord knows what the hell else, including the stuff that I'm trying to finish right now. Like I haven't even touched Bayonetta two. And I did just a tiny bit of the Mario plus rabbits, which I'll, I'll put a little more time in since I bought it, but I don't have like the highest of hopes for, but, and I haven't touched blossom tails yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> God damn. <laughs> and that's like, and I think to myself, like, man, it sure is a shame that I'm missing on a God of War, but I don't know when I'd play it. <laughs> so and that's the, the thing that helps me sleep at night about not having a PS4. Cause I did spend, I actually did get the try over at Mauricio's house. I finally tried Dragon Ball Fighter Z and it is freaking cool. Isn't it? It's freaking cool. I would love to spend a crap load of time with that game. And if they announce it for Switch, God help me because I'll have to buy it. Yeah, you really will. And then I don't know what I'm going to do because Runner 3 looks incredible. And like, and the, make, just think about the freaking Legacy Collection 1 and 2. Like, that's 10 freaking Mega Man games right there. And But I've, I mean, to I be fair, played, those, are, those are old. They are old, but I haven't played 8, 9, and 10 like in a long time, in a really long time. And, you know, it, uh, that'll be a really fun thing to, to blow through again. I don't even think I've played six in a long time. And then, right. you know, the Street Fighter stuff is is what it is. But that's just kind of I'm buying that digital and that's just going to be a thing that I have that I mess around with whenever I can. And like that, I, I'm kind of itching to replay Donkey Kong because I've been I, the music's been coming up on my uh, iPod a lot lately. And I'm like, damn, this game was good. And it would be really nice to play that on the go and with shorter load of time, load times. And I saw the trailer for Wolfenstein and I talked about last week how I haven't played any of the X games with the exception of one and two and two I hated. One is one of my favorite games ever. So that's going to be a hell of a lot of fun to blow through. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> Too many video games and I love it. It's a good love problem. It and I hate it. Good, good problem, problem to have. have. All right. Uh, well, we've been at this for a while. Let's start our actual show. huh? <laughs> Oh, goodness. Uh, all right. So here we are, 10, 20, 30 for, um, what month is this? April? April. April 2018. So we're going to talk about games that came out in April of 2008, 1998, and 1988. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice, relatively tight package here. So let's let's get to work. All right. The biggest, the biggest game to come out in, in April of 2008 clearly is Target Terror for the Wii. <laughs> Clearly, it's Clearly, Target Terror. The most important release of uh, April 2008. I can't imagine why this game didn't do well. No, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Um, this game's freaking awesome. Have you ever played this game? No, I have not. It's, We've I mean, talked it's an about game. it before. Yeah. yeah, it's an arcade-like on shooter, and I've, I, I think I've seen the arcade version of this somewhere on the boardwalk. But yeah, no, I bought this game. Well, as soon as I, I remember this coming out and thinking like, you got to be freaking kidding me. This looks like garbage. And then I found out what it was. And I was like, oh my God, I need to have this in my life. 
I took it home and Karen and I played the hell out of this game because it's it's like Area 51, basically. It's it, right down to the live action. Uh, it's all like live action actors a la Area 51, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> it is it is so unbelievable that this game exists. And uh, I was so, so happy about it. This was great. But there's not a lot more to say about it. <laughs> no, there's re- I mean, there's really not, you know, it's, it, it's yeah, it's it's it is stupid what it good. is. Yeah, it is exactly what it is. It's stupid great, and I, I, I highly recommend tracking it down if you're a fan of those kinds of stupid like on games, because I am. I, I love it, and the Wii was great for that. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> freaking Night Trap is coming out on Switch, which is... <sighs> which is also awesome. Is it? No. I'll tell you what's <laughs> awesome. is. Did you see the trailer for it? No, I did not. The trailer opens with the, with the actual footage of Howard Lincoln at... at uh, at Congress saying, wow, Night Trap will never come to a Nintendo platform. Wow. And then hard cut to the Switch logo. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Like, for that reason alone, alone, I'm super thrilled that this game is coming out on Switch, but I'm not going anywhere near it. I still yeah. think the game is trash. That's crazy. All right. So the rest of the stuff that came out in April of uh, 2008 is actually really solid. Um, yeah. This this the rest of this month was really really good. Um. So Mario Kart Wii came out uh in April of 2008. That was uh kind of a big deal. It one of the best Wii games, um, without question. I think. Uh, was easily one fun. of the best selling ones. <laughs> Certainly one of the best selling ones, but I think uh, like one of the best. Um, games on the Wii, like kind of objectively, it did sell a shit ton of those steering wheel controllers. It did or adapters. Um, but it worked though. Like exactly. that's one of the that's one of the only times that one of those peripherals like that really honestly felt good to use. It did. It it. it you know what's really cool about Mario Kart Wii is that it got Karen into Mario Kart Mm -hmm. with with the motion controls with the steering wheel. And like, that's what got her to be like, I can pick this up. I can do this. And that was, that was, that was actually witnessing Nintendo's blue ocean strategy freaking working in my house. Like, right. Crap. This does work. (laughs) You know, this is simple enough. I can do this. She picked it up and she played it. She got good with the wheel. And then she started just ignoring the wheel and just using the Wii remote. And then she was like, I got to try this because I was kicking her ass because I was using the the classic controller. She's like, all right, I got to try this thing. And then she got good with the classic controller. And now that's right. You know, now she's like, I won't, I won't touch these trashy motion controls. Give me a real controller. <laughs> well, but it was a really good entry point into the series and it made it immediately familiar for like anyone who drives. Oh, okay. I get this. Exactly. Right? This sort of, this sort of works and makes sense and f- not for nothing i mean you know you and i bag on the motion controls for uh quite quite a bit of uh content but the motion control application in this was was pretty good like it it was just sensitive enough and you could still power slide and you know yeah cut corners the way you had to and like everything worked really really well yeah, and that's that's kind of the that's kind of the lesson that was learned from the Wii when you look back on it is that motion controls when used sparingly and intelligently are a good thing. Mm-hmm. But it's got to be it's got to be smart. It's, it's it can't be it can't be insanity. It can't be Twilight Princess. <laughs> right. Now, there wasn't anything particularly like groundbreaking in this one. There wasn't anything that was like Oh, a super cool new character, or yeah, there were some good tracks. Uh, some there were good, good tracks. Like, there's music. nothing that it introduced motorcycles. Yeah, the motors, and Yay. they were fun. You know, there's nothing that really I think stands out about this one, um, other than in a negative light, which would be the uh, the Mies as characters. Because no, <laughs> you know what's what's the worst thing about the Mies as characters was the voices, it, like. It's- Awful. I didn't even because like to a certain extent it was fun when you got like okay like so we can play as our our armies but you can also play as enemy on the console so I can play as Admiral Akbar and that's fantastic right but then they all have these really disturbing like like my me had a really disturbingly deep voice and it was just ugh, ooh. yeah not oh, not cool you know and certainly I don't think one of the ones that anybody is going to like 
rush back to like, oh, we need a remaster of fucking Mario Kart Wii. Exactly. But when you go back to like, say, the, the Mario Kart Wii stages that are included in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe or even just Mario Kart 8, uh, that's really cool because there was some good stuff to this one. The uh, but, um, the farm one. Exactly, Moo Moo Meadows. Moo Moo Meadows, yeah, yes. there you go. Love that stage. That one's really good. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great, really great, great stage. Track. Great stage, great music. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's that was this game's defining trait was accessibility. And while that's not really something that most of us will go back to, like, you know, nobody's going to look back on this the same way people look at Double Dash. Right, uh, but right. at the same time, it was a very important game for them because it made them a shitload of money. It really did, really did. Now, uh, the next one was also a, a, a Wii game. This was the Wii port of Okami. This mm-hmm. was one of like the most obvious things. Uh, right, like this was just like okay, of course you would put Okami on Wii because you can play it with like. You know, Zelda with the Wii Remote Nunchuck just fine without using any motion controls except for to do the drawing on the screen. And they Capcommed it up, and somehow the drawing just felt terrible. Yeah, it did not work. It should have been great. Yeah, like, that was my, that's been my problem with Okami since day one, is I've never... I didn't like the drawing with the analog stick on the PlayStation 1, and nope. I didn't like the drawing with the Wii Remote in the Wii 1. I haven't found a version of this game where that drawing mechanic feels the way I want it to feel, and... I, but this it's it's still it's still Okami and it's still gr- a really cool game. Uh, I I would say more positive things about it, but I haven't played a ton of it. You know, I I bought it on PlayStation, I bought it on Wii, and I made it through a, a couple of hours. But the game never really caught me the way that it caught a lot of other people. I loved it, looking at it, but I never got in, engrossed in it. It should be everybody's favorite game. Like this, this should be the game that was like, oh my god. Like, have you played Okami? And while that it is to a point for some people, it is not the runaway success that it really should have been because the drawing control, you're right, just doesn't feel good. Yeah. And it is such, it is such a crux of the game. And like what, what I think, because here's the thing, like the drawing mechanic in the game works, right? It is adequate. It is frustrating at times, but it does work more often than it doesn't. I think the biggest problem that I had, because I was over the moon excited for this game, and, you know, one of the biggest disappointments I've had, because everything in this game is presented as being incredibly elegant. The way the game looks, the way the character, the way Amaterasu moves... The way the story is told, everything there there is a, a level of elegance to it. And then when you go to the drawing mechanic, it's kinda clunky. Yeah, it just doesn't feel good. And it just, that's it really takes what this you game right needs. out of it. Yeah, and, and like literally, you know, it turn it the whole screen turns into a flat canvas and tilts back and then you're painting on it with a brush, which is it's such a cool idea. I just wish that, and the fact that the Wii one doesn't feel good is is insane to me. It is absolutely yeah. insane. Yeah. Like that should have been completely natural, but you have to do this bit where you press the button and it pushes the paintbrush down, and like, because why? I have the paintbrush here. I'm gonna fucking do the thing. Exactly, and it's like it's a celestial brush. It's like you don't have to. Even if you're using a real bl- brush, it feels like you're putting more pressure on that brush than you would. When than you would using a real brush. And I think it's more like a calligraphy kind of thing that they were going for. Right. But that is such a precision thing. You would, ha- I would almost, I would have wanted them to treat that less realistically for um, calligraphy and more uh, just for fun, you know? Like, more elegant. Exactly. We're talking about, it's the same difference between like Gran Turismo and Burnout, you know? Like right. one of them is technically super realistic, but the other one's actually fun to do. Right. And that's that's what they needed to to get right with the the painting mechanic in Okami. Cuz goddamn it does it look good. Goddamn like, does they, it look good. I can't wait to play the HD one. I really can't. If they put in a mode in the game where all of the painting was done automatically, it'd be the best selling game of all time. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, it it would it would sell Tons and tons and tons of copies. It would certainly have put it on more equal footing with something like a a, 
uh, Team Ico game, you know, which like, is where just it should as an be. Art, artistic piece of awesomeness, and yeah, yeah it's, and it's just not. It's exactly where it should be, but it just isn't. They should get Platinum to make a sequel to it and they iron really some should. shit out. They should anyway, get Team Ico to make a fucking sequel to it. That would be crazy. Actually, no, fuck that, because it'll never come out. Get Blue Point <laughs> Games though, who made the fucking <laughs> Shadow of the Colossus remake. There you get go. Them yeah, get them it. to do it. Yeah. All right, so uh, next up we have The World Ends With You for DS. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a game I have never played. Um, Have you played it? Now I have to remember which one this is. I think I have. It's the one that looks... It's got very Kingdom Hearts-esque art. Uh, It uses both screens at the same time. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got some rhythm elements to it. Yeah, I always wanted to play it, just never got around to it. Um, It's the one that's coming back out on the Switch. Yeah, there's a whole... Like ground up remake of it actually uh, for the Switch Switch coming out soon. Um, it's not on. It's it fell off my list. Like I read you the list of things that I got coming up, and yeah. Okami HD and this weren't on that list because I just I don't have it in me to do that. I did not spend it a- as much time with this as I would have liked to. Um, but this might be something that I rebuy on Switch. I know it. It certainly has its cult following that. You know, people are very... I mean, obviously, it's getting a Switch remake. Yeah. You know, that doesn't happen 10 years into a game like this um, without without there being some clamoring for it, you know? Yeah, this is definitely a game that's resonated with folks for a long time because um, people, people have never stopped talking about this game. Right. And it's just always kind of been in the uh, in the pantheon of things that people are begging for a sequel to or... Or something. So hopefully this. Uh, the, I I hope the Switch version takes off. Um. Uh, and and it, it goes somewhere from there because Squares certain factions of Square have been doing some really interesting stuff. Uh, particularly I'm looking at Octopath Traveler. That game just mm-hmm. every time I see it, that game just looks nuts, and I can't believe it's real. Right. Because it's like, all right, here's this this big budget RPG that looks like a souped up Super Nintendo game. Which is insane to me. It's yeah, like I'm this, into that idea. I, I, I love I'm, that I'm idea. really into it too. It looks it looks awesome. All right, last game of two thousand of April two thousand eight is one that I don't think either of us are super fond of, but nope. there's no denying that it was pretty darn huge at the time. And then is Grand Theft Auto IV. Gra- my favorite. as my customers would say, Grand Theft Auto IV. If you're not old enough to know what a freaking no- Roman numeral is, you're not old enough to buy Grand Theft Auto Four. Yep, you are not. So uh Man. yeah, this was um this is the one with Nico, right? This yeah. was the this was the one that I bought because I really wanted to try it. I liked the trailer so much and I'd heard so much about GTA over the years and none of the games ever really got me because I've never been into open world stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh but I thought this one, you know what? I'm going to make a real solid effort with this one and I'm going to give this one a go and sure. I sat at home with it for like one solid night of just trying to like it. And I was trying real hard to like it. But you know what? The the thing that bugged me most was like auto is one of the three words in your title, and the driving is horrible in this. Always game. has putrid. been putrid. Always has been. I don't understand why the driving has always been so bad in Grand Theft Auto. But it's, it's awful, garbage. The walking around didn't feel too good either. Like I feel like Nico had a real serious lean going on when he turned. Yeah. Like he would just really lean when he. Uh, I don't know. They're, Things about this game ripped me right out of it. Uh, so no matter how much I wanted to get involved in it and how much I wanted to play through it and you know be a part of the conversation and everything, I just th- didn't catch me at all. There, I tried. I dumped 60 freaking dollars on it and took it home and popped it on my Xbox 360. I gave it the college try, and it was just a big fat nope. I, I, I don't... I mean, because we've talked about it before. I, I just don't get it. Like, objectively, they're not very good games. The I driving like... is terrible. The shooting mechanic sucks. The characters all look clunky as hell when they're moving around. The script is okay. The acting is okay. The stories are no better or worse than any Saturday afternoon mob movie. I... And like GTA Five must have gotten some of this stuff right because GTA Five is still selling well. Well, Tiff Tiff just sent me this thing um, that popped up in her email feed. Um, 
the number of units that Grand Theft Auto V sold in 2017, which is four years after its release, mm -hmm. was 15 million. Yeah, it's freaking nuts, isn't it? Coming up on what's the what's the landmark? It's coming up to. Uh... It is. It is past. It has sold more than 90 million copies since the game came out. Yeah, like it, it is heading to a hundred yeah. million copies they're of Grand Theft Auto Five. It's um, it's made more money than any piece of entertainment in yep. history. Yep. So the, clearly, they did something right with GTA Five because people are still playing it and having fun with it. There's an online mode to it, but that was not in GTA Four. <laughs> it's I I mean. Because the thing about, like, the Grand Theft Auto series was that when w Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2 are, like, top-down games that are okay, they were fine on the original PlayStation, but they weren't big sellers. Grand Theft Auto 3 was a huge seller because nothing else had been like that. Mm -hmm. Didn't make it any good. <laughs> But it was different, and it was new, and it was the first time that there was this big, expansive world. And then Vice City was a little bit better. Vice City's really the only one that I even liked a little bit. I just like the setting and the soundtrack and, you know, the neon in the 80s. And I like Scarface. Fuck you. Whatever. <laughs> um, San Andreas uh, is problematic from you know, a, a cultural sensitivity standpoint, there is a lot of horrendously stereotyped caricatures in that game in particular, um, where they're not even coming at it from a place of like parody or a place of, of ignorance. It is, it is just a place of, this is what black people sound like. It really is Christ. though. I'm no, I mean, go look at that game. It's, fucking offensive I don't on many many levels game. what i don't want to look at that game i've never wanted to look at that game i mean san san andreas is problematic in in a ton of areas and i think we can say after almost 200 episodes of this show i'm not one who throws around stuff like that lightly <laughs> you know what i mean but like yeah, you're not dean <laughs> i'm not dean but it is, it is a highly highly problematic uh piece of entertainment a lot of that was fixed going forward in Grand Theft Auto 4. The caricatures of uh, of the people that it is portraying are not nearly as offensive as those were. But, but man, they're just not great. I don't get it. I don't know, Chris. I don't either. Maybe, I do know maybe we are too fucking woke. Maybe we are. Maybe you are. So one of us has to be. One of us has to be. And it's <laughs> sure, sure as shit ain't me. No, it definitely is. Uh, I mean, I, man, so, but I, no I doubt. Say, I didn't even get, I didn't even get far enough in San Andreas to notice that kind of shit. Like, that's how little that game appealed to me. It's right from the very beginning. I mean, right from the very beginning. That's what I'm saying. I never turned the thing on. <laughs> yeah. I've oh, seen okay. trailers and said, this does not appeal to me. I don't like the way this looks. And it's one of those, like, you know, jack of all trades, master and none kind of situations that's mm -hmm. always bugged me about open world games, which is why I was so surprised that I liked Breath of the Wild as much as I did, because open world games, I've always been like this. All right, well, this is the sacrifice. You know, this game looks like this. You know, when you look at San Andreas on PlayStation 2, it's not pretty. And when you're playing shit like, you know, I don't, I don't know where we were at this point where God of War was, but like... We're playing games, you know, Metal Gear Solid 2 existed at this point. And playing um, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas after something like Metal Gear Solid 2, it's like, I get that there's so much more to this, which is why it needs to look the way it does, but this is, I don't mean to sound superficial, but if a game is that ugly, it's got to play really good to right. make up for it. And nothing about that I had ever seen made me think that that was going to be the case. But that's why I wanted to jump on GTA 4, because it seemed like they had, since they were on PS3 and 360, they had cleared that hurdle. They were now at a point where the system was powerful enough to give us impressive visuals to match this gameplay that people seemed to connect with. And I had ho always hoped that it wasn't just the fact that you could beat up hookers. 
But I right. mean, that is a considerable part of that audience, apparently. So, ah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I just it it's obviously not for us, and and it is for for a lot of people. Um, man, <laughs> yeah, GTA Four was a big big fat letdown. Yeah, really was. All right. Let's uh let, let's let's cut it here. We're going to take ourselves a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the games that came out in 1998 and 1988 uh in the month of April. So, uh you're listening to the Stone Age Camera podcast from geekade.com. So stick around. And now here's a look at some of the other original content available right now at geekade.com. First up, do you, Chris? <laughs> the answer is no, Dan. Okay, I didn't think so. All right, moving on. No, do you <laughs> know anyone who has any idea what's going on in the FX show Legion? I don't think anyone on the planet does, including the people making the show. Tiff is raising her hand. She says she does. I'm going to quiz her off the air. Are you... <laughs> well acquainted with characters with names like Farouk. I mean, I am. He's Tiff Shadow is, King. Yeah. Tiff is a, a, as well. Do you know the difference between Carrie Loudermilk and Carrie Loudermilk? I don't. I, I, I don't know. Well, whether or not you can answer any of these questions, you should probably check out Legion of Spoilers, our weekly recap series wherein Trish Reyes does her level best to make sense of the brilliant insanity that is Legion. Don't miss this week's edition, Legion of Spoilers, Chapter 11. Yeah, I don't I don't watch Legion. I'd like to. It's on my list, but like uh it's just it's never been anything I I've, I've caught up on. I've watched the first episode of the first season and been like, "Wow, I want to watch the hell out of this." And boy is it weird. But it didn't uh, it didn't grab me. I edit these uh recaps every week. So Yeah. But so that's you just feel it. like you know I, what's going on? I don't know that I do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like even though I've read all this stuff and I know things that happen, I just don't know that any of this is actually a spoiler for me. So, yeah, yeah. No, I, I really dug. Uh, really dug the the concept of this show. Yeah, no. Trish Trish does a great job writing it as well. Uh, the show itself, like I get more enjoyment reading her spoilers than I do actually watching the show. Huh. Well, look at that. Yeah. Anyway, next, uh, this week, Matt Ramo, not Matt much, because he's not my co-host on Wave Back, but Matt and I finished up our two-episode vacation in Donkey Kong Country. With the back half of the soundtrack loaded with some of the very best music in the series, we had a heck of a time listening to the ambient sounds of the temple stages, rocking out to the unfathomably 90s Funky Kong theme, and listening in awe to some of the best final boss music in the universe. If you're a fan of awesome video game music, be sure to check out Wave Back, episode 55, Donkey Kong Country, part two. Finally, Chris, just like a real bullet journal, articles about bullet journaling are only good if you follow up with them, which is exactly what Karen did. Having spent a considerable amount of quality time with her own bullet journal, she thought it would be a good idea to update everyone with a breakdown of what worked, what didn't work, and what she's still trying to get to work. Don't miss Bujo 2, Electric Bujo Lu, see what she did there, located in the thing. So proud of my wife for coming up with that name. What, Bujo 2, Electric Bujo Lu? Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. Anyway, you can catch all this great stuff, plus tons of other articles, videos, podcasts, and more right now at geekade.com. Except if you like stuff about wrestling and beer, because some asshole doesn't write about Anyway, we are back. Hi. How hey, you been? Let's, I'm good. Let's, let's do this thing. Where let's, have let's, you been, Chris? I have been... waiting. Been, 
I've been investigating Twitch Prime, Dan. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, let's talk about April of 1998, shall we? Let's do it. Uh, Diablo came out on PlayStation. I think that's how you pronounce it. That yeah, seems that's, right. That's, that's, that seems right. Diablo. Yeah, the, original, the, <laughs> the original Diablo came out on PlayStation, and uh, this is one of those things that I've, I've always known is a big deal, and I'm just not in on it. Me neither. I don't get it. I've never tried it. It seemed like one of those things like I needed to know something about before going in. So I was always too intimidated to, to really give it a whirl. I don't I don't know that that's true, but I still don't know it. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know anything about uh Diablo. I know people love it. People do. We aren't those people apparently. We're we're really not. I know what you love, though. What's that? Blasto. You love Blasto. Yeah. Why do I love Blasto so much, Chris? Because you love Phil Hartman? It's a horrible game, though. <laughs> Is it? I don't remember much about it. I remember no, I played it back in the day. Oh, God, it sucks. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it sucked back then. With, uh, yeah, well, I'm sure it's it hasn't aged well. It's a freaking 3D PlayStation One action game. the The platforming is is garbage. the The hottest of garbage. Has this I, been re released on anything? I don't think so. It's a I, first party Sony title. Like it was even developed by Sony Interactive. So right, I mean this this it it, it had like it had a big push behind it, and Blasto was going to be a big. Um, like a yeah. big deal, and Holy uh, crap. yeah, this has never been nothing. released on anything. Nothing, it and maybe that might honestly have more to do with Phil Hartman being the voice of Blasto and things with his estate since he was well murdered, um, relatively soon after this came out. Did he have a stake in this? Like, how has how I, has Sony not gone back to the well on this? Like, well, you might they might not have been able to get the rights to it, depending on certain things. Like, there's certain things I know with um, Robin Williams and the genie. Like, he had certain things yeah. um, negotiated into his contract and whatnot that that couldn't be used uh, upon his death and whatnot. So there's hmm. like there's stuff that cannot be done now that Robin Williams is dead, but. But I mean, just um, looking at this, I can't imagine that there was any high art in this that Phil Hartman felt incredibly connected to mm. that needed to be preserved. Because like, I'm watching a gameplay video of this right now, and it is ridiculous. I mean, I remember enjoying it. I remember liking it. I remember loving Phil Hartman. Oh uh, yeah, Phil Hartman game. was great. You know, there's a lot of comedy to it. Um, it's a it's a fucking terrible game. But it's worth playing to hear the the wonderful Phil Hartman just being ridiculous. Awesome anyway, stuff. I, yeah, awesome, not awesome. Awesome idea. Awesomely not awesome. <laughs> Awesomely not awesome. Uh, but actually awesome. You know, in fact, the next three games are actually awesomely awesome. Tekken 3 is awesomely <clears throat> awesome. God, do I love Tekken 3. I wish I loved Tekken more than I do, but I respect Tekken like through the roof. I've Man. never, because I could, I can never, so the way I play fighting games is I have kind of this just like, I get the basics down and I kind of work with that. I've never felt good with the basics of Tekken. Okay. Um, like I, Soul Calibur clicks with me so much more than Tekken does, but I'll try Tekken games whenever they come out and I, they always look cool. And uh, I, just, I think Tekken is super cool. I just wish I was better at it. I adored Tekken 3. You did. I remember playing it in your dorm room. Oh, I was so good at it. I was so good at Tekken 3. It was it was a game. It was one of the the last games in the arcade that I was able to just take people's money. <laughs> like, come on, put up your quarters cuz I will just Eddie Gordo the shit out of you. Which I know a lot of people thought was uh was cheap back at the time cuz that dude fighting with a uh, a capoeira style of of martial arts was so different and he moved so differently and was really hard to fight against uh, if somebody was good at playing Eddie Gordo um i just always really liked the uh the different fighting styles that Tekken had like i feel that like 
they really did a good job of incorporating different styles of fighting into that game. Yeah, I definitely always connected more with Tekken than Virtua Fighter. And I love Virtua Fighter as well. I mean, I, I don't know how much you remember playing Virtua Fighter 4. I remember my, playing Virtua Fighter 4 with you like apartment once. In, my, yeah. in, my, in my apartment in college, but... But you that know, was there's... it. Like I played it with you, and you were uh, going off on all this stuff, and I just never. And I was like, I, I don't, I don't feel like learning this. This is this, this does not seem like fun to me. Yeah, it, it. Those games are definitely games that you have to learn how to fight in that style. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to understand when you're when you should be comboing or attacking or defending or countering or whatever. You got to know what a crumpet is to understand you, cricket. <laughs> clearly. Tekken, I feel like, did a better job of what Virtual Fighter was going for. It made it more accessible. I don't know exactly. that it was more realistic, but it was more no. fun. No, well, I mean, there's nobody running around with a friggin' lion on their head. So, yeah, <laughs> there's robots but, and, and... God, King is fun to play. Yeah, and that's when what's you're cool. good with Tekken, him, Tekken oh was... Oh, my God, so fun to play. Tekken seems to be built more around fun than uh, than realism, which I guess you know we're, we're right back to that that conversation again. Right, Gran Turismo versus Burnout. But right, speaking of fun versus uh, realism, Hot Shots Golf also came out in uh, April mm. of nineteen ninety eight. Man, do I love me some Hot Shots Golf! I never got into these fun golf games. So um, fun. None of the, not even the Mario Golf ones. The Hot Shots Golf just, I just never got into them for for some reason. I just I played the hell out of the Hot Shot series. There, I don't know, and uh, there's nothing like I can't think of anything that is stand out special about them. They're just really fun. They're just really fun golf games. And they're you know not overly challenging, but they're just challenging enough. And I man, I really like them. The only golf game I've ever spent a ton of time on Kirby stream course <laughs> Jesus. Stop and it's only like vaguely a golf game Stop it. <laughs> i don't know if they come out with a you know because because these are the you know this is camelot they're the folks who did hot shots and they did them the mario stuff as well right. so and everybody's um, golf are they doing yeah. that one did they do that one too the i new, don't think so i mean that is just the new hot shots golf I don't Everybody's know. Everybody's golf. Uh, that was developed by Camelot. Yeah, there you go. They make really fun, accessible golf games. Oh, wait a second. Everybody's golf is a series. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. Uh, the 2017 one uh, was no, no, that was not them. Mm-hmm. Everybody's golf was originally done by Camelot. Okay. Now it is done by a company called Clap Hands. Clap H-A-N-Z. Hands Say Yeah. One of my favorite hipster bands. Anyway. <laughs> so that's, I had no idea Everybody's Golf was a was a thing. Well, then who made Golf Story? Because that was the other one that everyone was talking about. But that's more of an RPG, right? Or it's a oh, golf every- game with RPG elements to it. Is Everybody's Golf not that? I don't believe so. I haven't played it yet to be completely Hmm. honest yeah i was under the impression that both those games had a lot in common yeah golf story is supposed to have a lot in common with um the mario golf on game boy color which Mm -hmm. is supposed to be like the greatest thing since sliced bread yeah uh it's like a golf rpg and golf story is apparently amazing but i've also heard it 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 mentioned the same breath as everybody's golf a lot so i just assumed that the two of them had a lot more in common Right. I guess I'm wrong. And no, Camelot had nothing to do with that. That was a company called Sidebar Games oh. for Golf Story. This is uh this next comment uh is going to be completely out of context, but you know, whatever, leave it in there. Ape Escape, Chris. Ape Escape. My goodness. They did All keep right. that train moving for a while, but eh, I digress. Yeah. So the last one of nineteen ninety eight we're gonna discuss is Panzer Dragoon Saga for the Saturn. Mm-hmm. How much of this game have you played? Not much. Just Me what either. I've played with you. Gotcha. Yeah. Which is I've not played much. A, maybe about an hour of this game. Um, uh, my Saturn at the time 
uh, I think the the internal battery was dead, so I had no good way to save. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by the time I got that repaired or replaced, uh, I just never really got around to sitting down and spending the time with uh, Panzer Dragon Saga because you know I just yeah, I didn't have a Saturn connected to like my primary TV at that point, and uh, other things were were coming out. It's a game that I've wanted to spend a lot more time with. It's from what I've come to understand, because uh, I've also not played a lot of Skies of Arcadia, but I believe this, the the skeletal structure of the way that game functions came from Panzer Dragoon Saga. Hmm. Like well, I do play love Skies of Arcadia. Yeah, like the whole um, the the battle mechanic where you're in the airships is apparently very similar to the battle mechanic when you're riding the dragons in Panzer Dragoon Saga. Okay, well I'm into that. This Maybe game, I should have I mean, played more of it. This game's freaking cool though. Like it's got the it's the world of Panzer Dragoon is so neat. And uh, this game came out, um, let's see, this is 98. When was uh, this April of 98? When was Final Fantasy VII? In America, Final Fantasy VII was, was 94? Uh, September of 97. 97, Jesus. So... What the hell do I know? Yeah, it was about a, this was about a year after. And it's like... This is one of those things that should have done well for the Saturn. Like mm-hmm. coming off of the, po- you know, after the popularity of Final Fantasy VII took off, like RPGs of this caliber were a thing in America. Right. But unfortunately, this came out on the Saturn, <laughs> yeah. uh, which was really, really past its prime at this point, as far as like sales are concerned. Like it just wasn't even a competitor at this point. Uh, which is which is a real shame because Panzer Dragoon Saga is a real is a real gem. Um, even in the 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 limited amount of time I've spent playing the damn thing, um, and I, I really hope that it does get um, you know ported to something else at some point. Uh, it is you know they just announced all the Sega Ages things that are coming out on the Switch. I really hope that this uh, and they said that Saturn they would like to include Saturn and Dreamcast eventually. This is one of those games I'd love to see uh, ported. It really needs to be remastered, to be honest. I mean, because the the art direction is wonderful, but the graphics themselves are very aged. Right. Um, we could go with a whole reboot of Panzer Dragoon. Really? I mean, we really could. Panzer Dragoon Orta on Xbox was great. Was great. And uh, it was lo- wonderful to see that world with uh, with those kinds of graphics, and I would love to see more of that. Um just who the hell knows where this series is in Sega's a uh, right. pantheon of things to do, but Panzer Dragoon Saga, like this, should be remade because it's a game that almost nobody's played, and it's a really good one too. And in the hands of the right audience, I think it could do very well for itself. Agree. But I'm happy I own mine. I love my copy. All four discs, all glorious and, and wonderful. <laughs> I love the Panzer Dragon series so much. The only game I'm missing is the friggin' Tiger R Zone game, and it's right. stupid expensive, and it's probably terrible because it's a friggin' R Zone game. I'm sure, but it is a Panzer Dragoon game that I don't have, uh, which fills me with profound sadness. All right, let's travel back thirty years into the past to April of 1988 when we saw the release of oh boy, the way I spelled this kind of makes me question if I did this right. <laughs> Uh oh! Was it Fantasy Zone or Fantasy Star? You better find out. I am finding out. Fantasy Star came out in, well, it says 1988 here on Wikipedia. What about Fantasy Zone? Fantasy Zone on the Master System was May of '89, so it was Fantasy Star. All right. Yeah. Well, Must that's very different than Fantasy Zone. Although, P-H-A and T-A-S-Y Zone, like a crossover between those two? That would be awesome. That would be awesome. <clears throat> Play the hell out of that. Yeah, Fantasy Star on uh, uh, Sega Master System. Uh, the Fantasy Star is a series I have very little connection to. Um, this is uh, this was one of the ones that I really loved um, until it got to Fantasy Star Online. And then uh, I was like, well, no. Yeah, it just became such a different animal at that point. Uh, I think because... I spent more time with Fantasy Star. What was the? Oh no, I'm thinking of Shining Force. They were they were similar yeah. though. Fantasy Sim- Star like... Four was on Genesis. That's right. I was thinking of the Saturn one, which was Shining Force Three. Right. And I played a decent chunk of that. Um, Fantasy Star. What, man, I know I've played a bunch of one of the Fantasy Stars, and I can't remember which one it is now. Well, these were like 
back in the day when they used to describe uh, RPGs as dungeon crawlers. I mean, that, that's what this was. You know, you were making your way through a dungeon. And it was awesome, and it was uh, a cool... Yeah, you know, a, a cool RPG they, experience. Was it always the? I feel like I'm losing so much of my thought process on Fantasy Star, but it did did it always have a futuristic sci-fi slant to it? Yes. Or did that? Okay, that's right. All right. That was that was also what kind of set it apart. It was wasn't that a traditional fantasy game, you right? Know, swords and sorcery kind of a thing. I mean, that was there. You know, it was it was certainly there, but it was like. Like Star Wars, and fucking space wizards, exactly. You know, to to a point, like you had these more traditional, um, fantasy elements. You know, like dragons and Medusa and that kind of shit, but with a a slightly futuristic, um, like a fucking Lady Hawks vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like which is a reference that's lost on most of our listeners, except for Ferg, because I know Ferg loves Lady Hawks, and I. <laughs> I don't know that for a fact, but I am willing to bet dollars to donuts that Ferg is a Lady Hawks fan. Because Ferg is a man of good taste. Um, it's 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 a shame that this didn't take off the same way Final Fantasy did. Well, it was just it was very different. You know, the battles were uh, like first person um, battles. Like you were literally crawling through dungeons and like turning left or right down another hallway. Yeah, it had a lot of Dragon sort of Quest stuff. flavor to it. Yeah, much more but, uh, Dragon you know, Quest than Final Fantasy. And Shining Force, those, yeah. you know, basically basically the same thing, just a different setting. But this is one of those things that, like, it, had this been on the NES, it probably would have done very well. Um, Most likely. I mean, this, uh, this certainly did well enough to continue getting sequel after sequel until Fantasy Star Online blew the fuck up. Yeah. I mean, that, game, that game was huge. That game was huge, and then it just kind of disappeared for a while. And well, because now it's making a strange pseudo comeback on the Switch in Japan. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about all that, but I don't either. I mean, this first Fantasy Star was was very cool. You know, it was it was back in that time, thirty years ago, when we're getting all of these new things and these new genres and stuff we've never experienced before, and then out of nowhere, you know, comes this. Like we'd we had started getting used to, like all right, RPGs are Dungeons and Dragons, and it's old shit. And like, oh wait, there's this weird futuristic-y kind of thing. This is kind of cool and different. Lady Hawks. <laughs> I really like. I just. I really hope people this week are like, "What the fuck is Lady Hawks?" And they go back and they check out Lady Hawks because it's it's the right kind of terrible. It's really awesomely bad soundtrack too well uh <laughs> <laughs> are you not a lady hawks fan chris um, have you never seen lady hawks i don't think i've actually seen it i oh believe God. i know of it you're talking about the one where like you know the dude's a wolf or something and the girl's a, a bird and they can only be the opposite like they're human when he's a human when she's a bird and she's human when he's a wolf or something that is such a piss poor description of Lady Hawk, Chris. I got. <laughs> Am be I thinking with you. of the right thing? You are. Okay. Yeah, I've never seen it. But dude, it's 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 Rutger Hauer. <laughs> it's Michelle Pfeiffer. It's Matthew, like baby Matthew Broderick. It's amazing. And you know it's good because it's Lady Hawk H A W K E. Like, not just a K. There's an E at the end of fucking Lady Hawk. And that E is for exceptional. <laughs> the B is for bargain. <laughs> <laughs> Rucker well, Hauer fucking rules in Lady Hawk. Fuck, I'm going to watch Lady Hawk right now. Podcast <laughs> over. Thanks, everybody. Join us next week for some more <laughs> shit. Episode 200. Big thanks to people who make music. Bye. <laughs> Speaking of Lady Hawks, Double Dragon <laughs> came out of the. <laughs> Yes. Ah, oh, so different from the arcade. It was in a, in kind of a cool way. I liked um, I liked a lot about Double Dragon, even though it was like 
So you want a double dragon, double dragon, because right. uh, it was two players simultaneous, you know? Right. Like, you get with a friend and you beat people up. Yeah, get but it? In they, the, they didn't bury the lead on that one. They really didn't. But in the NES version, the only two-player mode was a versus mode. Yeah. So, but, And not a good one. And no, not a good one. <laughs> a hilarious one. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I don't even know I would go with hilarious, but... Oh, when you're running into the walls and shit, like yeah, yeah. you you yeah. you could definitely have some good comedy in there. Just pick two of Bobos and then just run into a wall. It's funny. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the the single player mode in Double Dragon, like it followed the basic you know level structure of the arcade games, but um, it added some like some other like light platforming elements and whatnot. Um, pretty good, pretty good music, like really good music actually. Um. And uh, like a leveling up system. It's like in the arcade game, you kind of just had these, you, you had your moves and you just blew through the game. But in this one, like your points that you got for beating up different dudes and dudettes uh, <laughs> equated to uh, hearts. And the more hearts you had, each heart you got would like give you a new move that you could do. Yeah. And that was that was kind of cool. This this game is is fun. It is a It is a good game. I don't know that it is necessarily the best double dragon game. Um, because you you are missing out on the whole like, I don't know. They did this weird thing where like they made uh, the shadow boss out to be Jimmy Lee instead of yeah, uh, just fighting him at the end for for Marion's affection, which is, was also kind of strange. Uh, I don't know. That was weird, especially once you got to the Double Dragon two, and I think there was like a bit in the instruction manual where they're like learning the error of his ways. Jimmy got back to being Billy's friend and. <laughs> Yeah, there's some weird stuff on there, but I lo- I always liked it. I was always a uh, a big Double Dragon fan. Oh um, God, me too. I loved the the three NES games. Absolutely loved them. They're was, very we, very fun. I, I played this before the arcade version. I remember not liking the arcade version very much because I played this NES one and then I played the the arcade one. And I was like, wow, this is slow. <laughs> this the arcade sucks. game is. So Super slow. It really is. It's pretty is. fun once you kind of get into the swing of things, but my boy, that game is slow. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a very, very different animal. But I mean, that's that's how things were. You know, we talked about the difference in Ninja Gaiden. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Ninja Gaiden, Rygar, etc. Yeah. This is a, a, a funny little side story here. Um, my friend, you know, legendary Sean Doyle. Mm. He um somebody at his house at one point was playing this game and they were at the end of the, uh, the construction level where you're fighting a uh, chin on top of the, uh, the, 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 con- the big construction site thing or whatever. And, uh, they, uh, they, they jumped off the side and got up. Okay. <laughs> they, like they survived falling down this entire thing. Nice. And like, I don't know. I don't know why I remember this after all these years, but it was like after it happened, this person said, "Not seven, not eight, but nine stories up." And I didn't fall. I wasn't pushed. I jumped. Why? Because I'm bad. I'm tough. I'm from the streets. Word to your mother's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> that has stuck with me ever since I heard that story. That's and every very time funny. I think of Double Dragon. What a great game. So uh, the last two ones we've got here are arcade hits. Uh, well, I use the word hits uh, very loosely here. Galaga 88, which I didn't even realize was an arcade game. I thought that was just on uh, Turbo Graphics, but now I'm confusing myself. Yeah, it was definitely an arcade game. Yeah. Hit the I mean, arcades in uh, April of 1988, according to my research, which could very well be wrong. Uh, yeah, I only played the TG16 version of this, and it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember playing it in the arcade, but uh, Galaga is mostly always awesome yeah and like i mean just galaga 88 is just such a cool it was a very cool remake of galaga yeah uh, a very cool fancy uh fancier version uh, you know because galaga is just uh, at its at its core is a very fun game and this is one of those like you know this it's 1988 so it's not like uh we're talking about super crazy improvements and in, in graphics and whatnot it still plays basically like Galaga, just a slightly souped up version. It's it's really nice looking. I, I I really like this game. It's it's always. I mean, you know, like I said, it it's Galaga. It's yeah. It's not a lot. It different didn't really from Galaga. reinvent yeah, it really, the wheel of of Galaga, but you know, it didn't really need to be reinvented. 
Exactly. This isn't like when uh, they tried to reinvent um, uh, Space Invaders. Right. On the uh, the GameCube. The hell was that game called? I forget. Space Invaders, the shitty version. Yeah. I think. Is what, it was, what they were going for. Oh, I gotta look that. I gotta look this up. What the hell was that game called? What a terrible, terrible game that was! Like, how dare they? <laughs> how very dare you? Space Raiders. There you go. Like they couldn't even. I, I, I don't understand this for so many reasons because it says from the creators of Space Invaders <laughs> on the cover, Space Raiders. Why Space didn't they Raiders. just call this Space Invaders? Because. I don't know. It's, it was published by Mastiff, I think. Mm. So it wasn't even Taito. Maybe that was the deal. Like Taito was like, "Nah, this is this is actual hot garbage, and we don't want this associated with our our brand." Yeah. So maybe that was the case because this was this was a pile of trash. Anyway, <laughs> don't hold back. Don't hold back, back to, Chris. Back to good stuff. I'm sorry. We actually don't have anything else good. Uh, no. <laughs> Last piece we've got is Bad Dudes versus Dragon Ninja for the arcade. Yes. Came out here in America. Ah, uh, this is not a great game. I love it. Fuck you. Oh, like, I love it. I love this game. It is not good. No, you're you're not wrong. It's it's this, actually awful. Yeah, like the first two stages are fun, and then by, after that, you're just like, holy crap! When is this game over? <laughs> oh, it's just it's, uh, it's just more more of this. Just more of this. All cool. right. No, thank you. Yeah, me and my buddy Brian beat this game at Yestercades a few years back. And like a couple levels in, we were like, wow, this is this stopped being fun a while ago, but we're still doing this. We're finishing this. We're rescuing Ronnie. Daggummit. We're doing it. We're doing it. We are bad enough dudes to rescue the president. We certainly are. <laughs> it's funny. If I, if I got that message today, I'd be like, meh. <laughs> keep them that's anyway, no, fine uh, you could i don't need them cool i don't need, we're good curious though what do you want with them <laughs> yeah what why do you have them what are ninjas doing with the president let's even back it up to 1988 to president right what were the ninjas doing with the president yeah with reagan it yeah, probably well, had something to do with the contra affair probably they or, love contra they do these are these are the Iranian Contras, very different. Very different. We're not talking about. We're not talking about Bill and Lance. No. Well, I mean, we might have. We might have. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know. They were some pretty bad dudes. They didn't wear shirts. They certainly were. <laughs> well, oh, well, there we go. No, we did it's it. Terrible. There you go. Yep. Hooray. Good times. How you doing, Dan? I'm good, man. Ready for Me bed, too. Chris. Me too. Let's let's you wrap sound, this up. You sound like you're feeling better than you were when we uh, started. So, I well, you know what? A rousing conversation about video games will always do that to me. Well, I am glad that I could arouse you. <laughs> Nobody does it like you, Dan. Nobody does. Oh. After 199 episodes, well, that's it. That is our show. Join us next week for our landmark 200th episode, where we'll be joined by Dean and Tiff for. The return of trivia time because we couldn't think of any better way to spend our 200th episode than tr than doing what we love, which is making fun of Dean. That's fucking <laughs> right. Really excited about it. Oh, I have tailored pieces of this. Uh, I've already written to most of the trivia questions, and I mean, is I'm it telling all you, going to be past episodes? No, I'm telling you right now, because I know Dean doesn't listen to the show, or at least not mm. that often, there is an entire round dedicated to Rainbow Six. <laughs> <laughs> I will study up. Once again, you can get in touch with us at mail at geekade.com, as well as all flavors of social media that we inhabit. You can like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram at Geekade, subscribe to our YouTube and Twitch channels for all our latest video content, including Dean building a Labo kit, and follow us on Twitter at the underscore Geekade. You can also find us individually on Twitter. I am at Geekade Chris, that's Geekade K R I S, and Dan, where can the Purples find you? At Geekade Dan. 
If you're interested in more information about anything we discussed here tonight, be sure to check out our show notes. And while you're at it, you can also subscribe to this and any of our other wonderful podcasts on iTunes or Stitcher, where if you're super nice, you can leave us a review because any and all feedback is welcome and appreciated. We'd also like to thank our intrepid editor, Evan, for making this show listenable for all you folks. We'd like to thank our uh, uh, Mark, not our Mark, he is a Mark, and his name is Mark TDK Knight, for our show's theme which you can check him out on SoundCloud and Bandcamp or his website, which we have linked to in the show notes. Again, always remember to keep your eyes on geekade.com for even more fresh original content. Thanks for listening, everybody. Dan and I are going to go to bed. Well, I'm going to go to bed. Dan's going to watch Ladyhawk. That's right. While I play Puzzle and Drag. <laughs> Living his best life. Living my hashtag best life hashtag blessed see you next week everyone for episode 200 thanks for listening nighty night Mm -hmm.